Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the University of New Hampshire's College of Health and Human Services and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the Department of Health Management and Policy here at the University of New Hampshire, and today I'm pleased to share with you a special episode of The Forge. On October 7th, the College of Health and Human Services and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives hosted a special event at the University of New Hampshire, Shaping the Future, Leadership and Public Policy in Healthcare. We had two panels and a keynote speaker, and it was a terrific event. You are listening to the keynote talk by Dr. Lewis Josephson, CEO of the Brattleboro Retreat. The talk was titled, From Broken System to Accountable Care, Improving Mental Health and Addiction Services by Putting Patients First. The slides for this presentation are also available on our website. The recordings of the other parts of the event are available on our website, healthleaderforge.org. And now, please enjoy Shaping the Future. Session with our keynote speaker. Again, my name is Mike Ferrar, and I serve as Dean at College of Health and Human Services. And what a great session we had this morning. Both sessions were just absolutely fabulous. And I'm glad our students were able to enjoy it as well. I think this is part of our mission uh, to expose all of our students, to expose our faculty and staff to what's happening in the environment. One of my priorities as dean when I came here about four years, years ago was to reach out to our partners. And my first year when I was here, I was actually started in March, John Bunker, who's the director of external relations, and myself, we visited with over 150 different people throughout the state of New Hampshire. And our three basic questions were, what does Mike need to know about New Hampshire? What have you partnered in with the college or with the university? And what do you see as the most pressing issues facing health and human services? And through those meetings, loud and clear came behavioral health. How are we going to address behavioral health as a state? How are we going to address behavioral health as a college, as a university? And how are we going to move this forward? Over the past couple of years, the college has done a number of initiatives to address some of the behavioral health issues within the state. We'll be launching our psych nurse practitioner program in January, which is phenomenal to address uh, the crisis that we have in the hospitals. We transitioned our master's of social work program to an online program. And we also have an addiction certificate uh, within our social work program. We're also focusing as a college on the broader efforts of what we can do to address mental health and behavioral health. I truly believe this is not only a crisis now, but it's going to continue along those lines for the next 20 years, and we have to address it head on. Uh, Jeannie Ryer, who is from our Institute of Health Pol Policy and Practice, is leading an effort around integrated behavioral health collaborative where she has recruited over 1,000 practices to integrate behavioral health into primary care. We're talking about developing a telehealth, telemedicine initiative within the college and how can we reach, reach out not only from a practitioner perspective, but to educate our students. And I see we have all of our students in the back, but those are some of the new technologies that we're going to have to uh, work with in order to uh, move into the future. We're fortunate to have Louis Josephson, Josephson here. He joined Brattle, Brattleboro Retreat as president and CEO in January of this year. He came to Brattleboro Retreat from Los Angeles, California. It's a bit of a distance uh, coming across where he served as president and chief executive officer of Vista Del Mar Child and Family Services since 2013. Before moving to California, Lewis is back here in New England, served as president and CEO of Riverbend Community Mental Health here in Concord, New Hampshire. While at Riverbend, he successfully stabilized the organization's finances, launched several innovative new clinical programs, and established new strategic alliances within the community health system. During the same time period, Dr. Joseph also served as Vice President of Behavioral Health for Concord Hospital. So it's my pleasure to introduce Louis Josephin. The plan for today, he'll do about a 20-minute presentation, and then we'll open 30 minutes? Yeah. 20, 30 minutes, give or take so. But then we want to open it up to some question and answer. So we'll have a, a brief Q&A period following uh, his presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Can, can people hear me? Is this mic working? Awesome, because I want to make sure people hear. So uh, it is great to be back here and see so many former colleagues and friends um, 
though, you know, you heard I, I was just out in Los Angeles for three years living in Beverly Hills. Now I'm in Brattleboro, Vermont. So if you decide not to listen to a word I say, I will understand that because it makes no sense what I've just done. Um, but it's great to be back. And uh, L.A. was great, too. I was saying it at lunch. Uh, just if it gives you any perspective on the behavioral health situation in New Hampshire in this area, it's just as bad in Los Angeles, California, I can tell you, and sometimes worse. So uh, we don't have the lock on problems. I do want to talk to you about behavioral health, and I, I think you're absolutely right. This issue has been bubbling up to the surface, and it's an issue hospital systems and communities are grappling with all over the states where we're here. And it's really at the nexus of, I think, uh, issues that are affecting our cost, are affecting quality of care, affecting our communities in terms of addictions and behavioral health. And I'm going to make a thesis here, an argument where I think that if we do things right, if we do the right things for our patients, then I think we'll see the financial benefits and as well as the community benefits. So I, I'm optimistic, um, and there was a whole little thread here about pessimism and optimism. I'm actually optimistic if we do the right thing by patients, we will be more successful in terms of the care of our community and as organizations as well. But we have a lot of challenges. So let me just take you through a few slides here. Okay, so the mental health system. Let me break the news to you. There is no system. There is no mental health system. I defy anyone here, I'll take the question later. Tell me what our mental health system is, what it looks like. As far as I'm concerned, there is none. It's basically a patchwork of services that have been developed since the Community Mental Health Act signed by President Kennedy back in 1963, but it's never been adequately invested in. And uh, as we were talking about earlier at the break, it's essentially, I know people have a hard time sometimes getting their heads around what do we do in behavioral health, but what we are given, our toolbox and our resources in behavioral health is the equivalent of giving a physician a patient with an infection and you've got, you'd want to prescribe a, a course of antibiotics for two weeks and you've got one week. And basically you're telling your patient to cut their pills in half like many of our patients do because they can't afford their pharmaceuticals. And so giving half a dose, we're supposed to somehow get the results that the patient needs within a system that's not a system. So we've never adequately invested. People always ask me, you know, what's the biggest mental health provider system, if you will, in the country? It's our jails. Our jails by far are where we're giving inpatient psychiatric care in this country. So again, think about this with a medical paradigm, if you will. We've got a lot of people in this country suffering from Alzheimer's, for example. There's behavioral symptoms that are part of Alzheimer's. People can get violent at times. People can get very dysregulated at times. Would we all be okay if grandma or great grandma was put in jail because the nursing home or the, the care facility couldn't handle their aggressive behavior when they're dysregulated? I think we'd say that was shocking and outrageous, but somehow when it comes to psychiatric illness, we're okay with people being served in jails. We have, and we are also talking about this at the lunch break, a chronic and worsening workforce issue. So I'm so glad to be talking here at the university with pe young people who are interested in coming into the field. We need your energy, your minds, your effort uh, in mental health and healthcare, of course, writ large, uh, but it's a crisis. We are, are losing psychiatrists uh, at a greater pace than we're replacing them in the workforce. And then, we've talked a lot about crisis, we've used the word crisis quite a lot. We have the largest health care disparity in our population when SPMI is seriously and persistently mentally ill. Adults are dying in this country on an average of 25 years earlier than the general population. That is the biggest health care disparity in the country, but I think if you asked even people in this room who are the most, some of the more informed people about health care, they wouldn't know this. And if you go to the World Health Organization, they say that by 2020, mental health uh, disability uh, and the effects of that will be the biggest public health issue in the entire world. So we don't always realize the magnitude of what we're facing when we're talking about mental health. And we're trying to do all of this without a system. And you could say this is, last bullet here, is actually the results of not having a, an adequate system. 
Okay, so uh, just from a little bit of a healthcare perspective, and as somebody who runs a psychiatric hospital now, this is a very uh, important slide for me. This shows the number of psychiatric beds in this country, uh, where they were in 1995, and where they are in 2010. So it really, at just a 15 year period, uh, we see the reduction in psychiatric hospitals and the reduction in psychiatric uni units within larger medical hospitals across the country. Um, so what do you think we see as a result of this? We see more homelessness. We see more repeat people in emergency rooms. Again, we're not having a continuum of care we need to treat people. So if this was, again, a corresponding medical bed slide, uh, can you imagine what we'd be talking about here? You would be saying, this is, this is crazy. You mean, I can't get my husband into a hospital bed when he had a cardiac event? You're kidding me, right? There's just no beds out there, so, so I had to kind of wait in an emergency room for eight days till I could get him into a cardiac uh, bed or unit. But that's really what we're talking about in psychiatry. I will tell you to try to bring this a little bit up to date, you're going to start seeing a, a small uptake, uh, uptick in this number um, in the last five years. I think a lot to do with the Affordable Care Act and some other incentives that are out there, but still we're way below where we would need for our population in terms of beds. Just a couple of statistics so you have this in your, in your mind uh, about the behavioral health field. CDC says that about half of us will develop a mental illness in our lifetimes. Uh, one in four adults experiences a mental disorder in any given year, and one in 17 lives with a serious mental illness like schizophrenia, uh, major depression, or bipolar disorder. And then here's our, our thing about 2020. So it's a very prevalent disease. And um, about 40% of people with mental health and substance abuse disorders never get treated. So that's just hold that in your head as we talk about accountable care and population health. And those who seek treatment typically do so after delays, which time they've gotten sicker. So often, uh, prevention, which we know when you're talking about population health, prevention is a key component of that in wellness activities. We are not doing very much of that, I would say, in behavioral health whatsoever. Uh, and then, of course, um, SAMHSA says that um, 2.5 million adults uh, um, uh, with substance abuse and mental health got appropriate treatment. So we've only got about 11% that got good dual disorder treatment in this country. So am I all depressing you significantly here? Okay. Um, so this is just a slide that shows that again, uh, the prevalence of behavioral health conditions in adults. And I'm happy to share these slides. I don't know if you have them and if you want to disseminate them for people, feel free. So what are we seeing in terms of conditions on the ground as healthcare providers, as people who care about our population and our communities? Number one thing I hear and I've observed and I've tried to manage when I was in Concord uh, is the emergency room. We're seeing more and more behavioral health patients in the emergency room. Concord Hospital, while I was there, uh, decided they were going to build a brand new behavioral health pod in their new emergency department called Yellow Pod. And we built it for a capacity of about six patients. And when I was there, this is just three years ago, uh, the number of patients hovered around six. Sometimes we'd be up to eight or nine. Other times it'd be a little bit less. And these are people who are waiting for a bed at the state hospital or some other psychiatric facility for days and days. So the length of stay was often three, five, seven days. Um, and now what I've told when I spoke to my medical, my old medical director at Concord Hospital recently, she said, Lewis, you have no idea. That number has more than doubled and people are waiting longer and longer. And I'm like, oh my God, how did this, how did this happen? Uh, but this is a real pain point uh, for patients. They're not getting adequate, adequate care. And many of the patients, at least at Concord, we have an inpatient or had an inpatient voluntary psychiatric unit with psychiatrists. So we would start active treatment in the emergency department. Research shows that if you do start active treatment medications in emergency departments, about 25% of those patients, symptoms will come down to the point where they don't need an inpatient psychiatric bed. But many of our community hospitals have no access to a psychiatrist, have no ability to start active treatment. And so people are waiting and waiting uh, maybe for a bed, if they had treatment, they wouldn't even need. So ERs are unsafe, they're costly, and it's not the right care. Uh, our community mental health centers are 
chronically unable to meet demand coming in their doors as well. So these are our community mental health partners who are providing outpatient services, residential services at times, uh, trying to keep people stable and healthy in the community. Um, police also are burdened uh, by people with untreated mental illness. And um, you know, if you haven't heard from your local PD, I'm sure they'd be happy to tell you about how many man hours they spend trying to uh, deal with people who are behaviorally dysregulated and need care and are not getting care. And then sort of our newest, though not new anymore, issue is the opioid crisis. So uh, we've got insufficient treatment options, uh, Vermont, uh, to their credit, uh, started what we call a hub and spoke program. I don't know if people are familiar with hub and spoke, but it's essentially a um, fairly robust, I'll be kind, fairly robust uh, suboxone treatment uh, service for people with opioid addiction. So people will come in, get suboxone treatment, get some drug counseling and, and trying to help them along in their recovery, and then out to their primary care physicians with support of their suboxone treatment. So yay. Great job, Vermont. We're very happy with that. As soon as they got up to the number of patients they said they could serve in these hub and spoke programs, we do one actually at the Brattleboro Retreat, um, they then decided to cut the Medicaid benefit for inpatient opioid detox. So does every person who's struggling with opioid addiction need an inpatient uh, detoxification process? No, but for a layer of them they do, and just to eliminate it as a benefit within Medicaid really made no sense if you're talking about a healthy continuum of services. So again, this goes back to our toolbox. You've got to have a robust toolbox for you to make a difference with these patients, and we're often working with one hand behind our backs. Okay, so what are some of the factors that limit access to care uh, besides the number of psychiatric beds and reduction of benefits? Just thought this would be an interesting one. Uh, if you ask most people in the street about accessing behavioral health, they say, I can't afford it. Now we're hopeful that the Affordable Care Act was going to really make a difference, certainly in the outpatient world because of the parity law. And I don't know if students have studied parity, but parity basically said a little bit different. So. Um, before parity, for example, I could go see my physician. I'm like recovering from a cold, let's say, which I am. So I, if I went to my doctor and he diagnosed me and he said, you know, I want to make sure you don't have pneumonia. I'm going to send you for a ch chest X-ray. And I want you to come back next week and follow up with me because I'm really concerned about your blood pressure, whatever it might be. He can just, as a doctor, prescribe the number of visits that are needed for my care, at least in the old fee-for-service uh, arrangement for sure. Parity was not the same with mental health. If I had a patient come to me with depression and I diagnosed them with depression and I think I need to see them for a period of three months to do some cognitive behavioral therapy with them, a managed care company would come in and say, mm -mm -mm, sorry, we will give you two sessions. Assess the patient, make sure what they need. Maybe we'll give you a couple more sessions after that. And you're in a fighting, haggling, uh, relationship to try to get commercial and other payers to give you adequate uh, coverage to meet the patient's needs. So Parity said you can't do that. You can't have people going to a health care provider, medical provider, and they can prescribe what's needed, but the, the mental health provider cannot. The problem is just because we passed the parity law does not mean the insurers are sort of saying, oh great, I can open up my checkbook and pay for all these mental health sessions that I never used to have to pay for. So it's really become house by house fighting where patients, communities, states are saying, sorry, you are to an insurer, you have not followed the parity law and, and give real examples and, and get into a fight with them. But most of the big issue in terms of access is cost, uh, some people say they could, a lot of people say they could uh, handle the problem without treatment at the time, 26%. 16% interestingly said, we don't have time for this. I don't need treatment. I don't want treatment. 15% um, said they don't know where to go for service. Uh, almost 12% said the health insurance did not cover enough treatment. 10%, 11% said treatment would not help. Uh, another 9% said they're concerned about confidentiality. Another 9% did not feel the need for treatment. Another 9% said might cause others to have a negative opinion or might have a negative effect on the job. So this is where mental health and substance abuse issues diverge from medical issues. 
and we've got the X factor, which is stigma, right? If maybe, in, maybe decades ago, if you had cancer, people would recoil and feel, oh my God, this person's got cancer. Nowadays, we've got walks and talks, and everyone's out there wearing pink for breast cancer awareness, which is terrific. But when you talk about mental health, uh, there's still stigma. Uh, stigma. So if you, I know it's hard to read in the back, uh, but here's somebody who's feeling pretty ill with the flu, and the person says, uh, have you tried, you know, not having the flu? Just, you know, don't have that flu. <laughs> um, but people will say that about mental illness. Would you just try not having depression? Just get over your anxiety. Come on, let's, let's just do this. So this is something that's in the mix that's different than other medical conditions. So I sort of painted a picture about what's going on at the macro level, what's going on a little bit in your communities, how we're struggling with the lack of a system, uh, but patients who are drawing a lot of resources, costing us money, not getting the right amount of care. So tying back to some of the earlier presentations, who's responsible for fixing this, right? Someone's got to care that we have this huge health disparity in mental illness compared to other conditions. Well, certainly our government, we've talked a bit about that today, and we, we'll, we can talk more about that. There's hospitals and healthcare providers. There's community organizations like community mental health centers and drug treatment centers. Police and jail are at the table. ACOs, which we'll talk a little bit about accountable care organizations, or maybe your organization, whatever it might be. So there's a lot of diffuse responsibility and accountability for who owns this. And um, hearing Rich talk uh, at the earlier panel, I'm not going to remember exactly what he said, so please, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent, but he said something in response to, we were really hurting financially, and we had all these people with psychosis and mental health issues, and yikes, that was just overwhelming, and it's costing us a lot of money, so we went and did something for seniors. I think that's kind of what he said, and I understand that completely. I am not critical of that, but that's the hot potato nature of what we do. A lot of people think it's overwhelming. These are kind of scary people with difficult conditions that can't be well treated. And so we'll focus on something we know a little bit better, like elder care. Nothing wrong with that. But I think we're both ignoring a tremendous need uh, and we're, I think, ignoring an opportunity. So how do we get to a win-win around behavioral health where we're making appropriate investments showing some return on those investments, uh, and also helping our bottom line and healthcare professionals. So the best thing is, and I, I feel the need to state this because as I go around talking to folks, often people think, I don't know if it's a, a media thing or a, a dramatic thing, but people are in therapy, for example, forever. You know, sort of the Woody Allen, I'm gonna be in therapy talking about my you know, problems for my entire life. Well, that's just not the case. I was meeting with a supporter of the retreat a couple of weeks ago, uh, and she said to me, I have a coworker, she works for Liberty Mutual Insurance Company, I have a coworker whose uh, teenage son is suffering from anxiety to the point where at different points during the week he has to leave school and come home. And so the supporter of the retreat said, did you think about getting him some help, some treatment? And the mom's like, I, I, no, 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 he'll just have to get over it type thing. And I said to them, you know, I have actively treated patients with a, assuming it's a straight anxiety disorder, in I could almost guarantee you within four to six weeks, maybe even less, but with it, definitely within four to six weeks, I can start improving that symptom picture. I can get him back to school on a more consistent basis. We've got treatment that works, and we need to, to basically say that. Um, some of it has to do with medications. Our medications are better, more sophisticated, more, more targeted, and as our, our talk therapies are really uh, at a different level than they were in the past. And just so you know, for yourself and your own lives and with your colleagues, the best combination is talk therapy and medication for depression, anxiety, and other uh, big uh, mental health issues that we have. Uh, treatment works and a combo therapy is often the best, best mix. So that's a really great thing. We've got something to offer. Now, you might think, and we were talking to someone else at the lunch break, uh, about, oh my God, we're, we're losing our shirts on people with behavioral health. And, uh, and we can't, you know, yeah, you know, maybe we're responsible a little bit, but isn't that's the government's responsibility. What, that, what about that Department of Mental Health, right? They, they're supposed to take care of these people. And if we wade into that and do that work or support that work, uh, we're taking, taking on responsibility we shouldn't have to have as a healthcare system. But 
people with mental illness are our patients right now, and they're not going away. They're your patients today, and they will be tomorrow. So if you look at this Venn diagram here, you've got uh, uh, people with medical conditions who have sort of an active medical condition that they're managing are about 58% of the population. We've got about 25% of our population at any point with a mental disorder in the adult population. And then you've got this, this Venn diagram piece where 68% of adults with mental disorders also have a chronic medical condition, and 29% of adults with medical conditions often have a mental disorder. So you think you're treating the diabetic patient, but I can tell you and I can point you to research articles that show that your diabetic patient may also likely have depression. And so you're not treating the whole person, this is the, the new sexy thing we talk about, the whole person, holistic treatment, if you're only treating the diabetes. And you're probably not gonna get the results in the diabetes care that you're trying to provide if you're not attending to their mental health condition. So there's a huge opportunity here, and I think we're just not aware of this, and practitioners are not always aware of it, and systems don't always think about it as an issue that we could tackle and make some progress on. So just another slide um, that tells us, I think, things we already know. We've seen this from dual eligible population studies. Are people familiar with dual eligibles? These are Medicare, Medicaid uh, population. Often adults with a chronic mental illness or disabled uh, are in this population. But if you, if you look at um, this, so we've got the blue bars is without depression and the green bar is with depression. This says me mental health expenditures uh, just with depression um, is 130, uh, I guess, bucks per, per person. I'm not sure. I'd have to get the citation a little bit better. And then medical expenditures um, and then total expenditures. So you see if you have just uh, a medical condition without uh, depression and then you add in depression, your spend on that patient is roughly a third or so more than uh, if you just didn't add depression. So. So just think about that in terms of what we're, what we're spending as a system. And the good news is when we talk about population health, our patients in mental health and addictions are no different than us. They're the same people, we are them. And the same risk factors that we need to improve for population health affect them as well. Tobacco use, alcohol consumption, poor nutrition and obesity, lack of exercise, unsafe sexual behavior, substance abuse, and inadequate medical care. These are all things that we have some ability to improve and do better with. Um, so so uh, that's good news for me as well. So um, what are some of the challenges with me managing chronic disease of patients with mental health disorders? Uh, half of the care for common mental health disorders are delivered in a general medical setting. So I'm again gonna push out to executives who are here from health systems. If you think you're not treating these people already, you're wrong. They're in your practices right now. They may not be managed optimally, but they're there and they need care. Uh, primary care providers prescribe the majority of psychotropic drugs for children and adults. Goes back to my earlier workforce slide. We don't have enough psychiatrists in this country. And good news is that, that primary care docs and family physicians are stepping up to help provide that. I would say to the psychiatrists in the room, I think they struggle at times, uh, and uh, they're out of their depth at times, but they are providing a lot of care. Um, but we still got a lot of undiagnosed mental disorders, untreated or undertreated in primary care. Um, and then this last bullet, when mental illness is recognized, it is not always adequately treated. Uh, and the referrals from primary care to specialty mental health are not completed, and that goes back to we don't have a mental health system. So if we have a, a good primary care doctor who identifies depression, starts treatment, the patient is treatment resistant, they're not responding to an antidepressant, and they want to refer to a specialty provider, it's often not there or not adequate. So, um, we should also know that treatment for mental health problems occurs mostly in an outpatient setting. So uh, of all the patients who are getting any kind of mental health care in this country, about 50% are getting only medication. 32% um, are getting some outpatient care and a medication, 13% only uh, outpatient therapy care. So it just gives you a sense of how we're treating people with mental health issues. 
Um, and then as we look at population health, as we look at accountable care, uh, somebody mentioned this morning about Vermont moving to an all-payer model. This is big news, all eyes on Vermont right now in terms of what that's going to mean and a big ACO that's being developed there. Um, we have to look at, somebody said, at the social determinants of health. And we know for mental health, um, we've got a lot of risk factors. We've got childhood adversity, we've got loss, abuse and neglect, household dysfunction, stress of all sorts, and the, po the socioeconomic factors of poverty or community, lack of social support and isolation, and that these things impact medical disorders. They also impact adult health behaviors like obesity and smoking and self-care, and they also impact mental disorders. So now I feel like probably some of healthcare folks in the room are getting a little nervous because, oh my God, you want a hospital to talk about this stuff? Like, wait a second, I'm Concord Hospital and I've got to worry about child abuse in my community? No, that's like beyond my mission. Um, the mission of Concord Hospital is we exist to serve patients and their families only, right? That's what we do when they come in the door. I don't think about all this other stuff. Um, but we might have to be uh, not doing it necessarily ourselves, but thinking about as a community how we address some of the social determinants uh, that affect all of these medical and mental health disorders. So um, somebody may have mentioned earlier about integrated care. That's sort of, again, the big thing in my neck of the woods. Um, and integrated care can look a lot of different ways. The federal government has incentivized and promoted integrated care. It could be mental health counselors and clinicians in a primary care office working uh, and seeing the same patients. Uh, it could be telepsychiatry to an emergency room or into a primary care office. Uh, but there are a lot of solutions out there, a lot of research and experiments that are going on. Um, and I just wanted to point out, if you're interested, um, the American Hospital Association, uh, SAMHSA and HRSA, there's so many resources out there. If you're interested in integration for your system, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of promising and best practices that exist already to try to do this. So just wanted to point that out, that there, uh, we're at the place where there's some solutions in place uh, at this point. So the good news that we've seen from this effort at integration and taking, taking a whole person approach is that integration has proved effective in lowering costs and improving outcomes for people with a mental disorder and a chronic health condition. Uh, this is, again, the dual eligible product, uh, projects have shown that. Um, and what I would contend, my last bullet is, in terms of how we think about moving forward with this issue, is that um, under ACOs and cap payments, global payments, these patients, the subset of mental health, uh, people with a mental health disorder and a chronic disease will be not just the pain in the neck patients that we don't know how to manage well, but will be the difference between your financial stability and sustainability or not. So, it's a big challenge to us and people say, well, I can't afford to invest in these patients. But if you don't afford to invest in these patients, you are already paying for them. And I've seen this in conversations I've had with hospitals in my region that said, we want to engage the Brattleboro Retreat in providing telepsychiatry for our emergency room because after a couple of days, I'm not getting paid for that patient anymore. And I've got security, and I've got nurses, and I've got somebody watching them, and ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. I'm spending a lot of money. If I paid you X to have a psychiatrist consult and start treatment, and somebody who knows the mental health system and helps get them out of the emergency room, it's worth it for me to pay that because I'm going to get a better outcome, and I'm actually going to save some money. Unfortunately, what I've found is as you talk about ACOs or One Care Vermont and the whole all-payer initiative, intellectually, hospital executives and boards, have, if you show them this slide deck, they have um, the intellectual recognition that this has some validity to it. Um, but everyone's so busy figuring out the change process. What am I going to do with orthopedics and oncology and imaging and all the things that have been the drivers for my success financially uh, in a hospital system? What am I going to do? And I, I really don't want to think about having to allocate some resources for something that really it's the Department of Mental Health's responsibility. I don't want to deal with that. I would just say the Department of Mental Health in all of your states is not coming on a shining horse to support this effort. They're just not gonna be doing it. So, so 
I'm saying all this, and I know I'm being a little provocative because I want to be a little provocative and see if I can get some good feedback when we, we do the discussions. Um, I wanted to just tell you about a little collaboration that the retreat has done over the last three years with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont that uh, I think shows some of the points that I, I want to talk about. So we established three years ago something we call Vermont Collaborative Care. Uh, it's a new model of care management for people with behavioral health. So Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has 200,000 plus members. Uh, for behavioral health and substance abuse needs, they went to a big national company that manages behavioral health called Magellan. And um, what they found over many years with Magellan managing the care of their, their insured people was that there was a high dissatisfaction rate. And out of their per member per month cost, Magellan was charging them, I think, almost $1.35 per month per member uh, cost. And they said, we're not getting the value we need. And so we came at them with the hypothesis that patients with mental health and addiction issues would use less care and less expensive care if they were given the right amount of treatment in their community. And this goes back to the whole triple aim, if you studied it all, the triple aim. The right care at the right time, hopefully at the right cost, um, is, the, is a good thing. So uh, if you think about my example before around parity, where if I called uh, the insurance company and said, I'm seeing someone with depression, can I get 10 sessions? And they nickel and dime me down to three. We took the opposite approach. So a therapist would call and say, I have a patient with depression. They're, they have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont insurance. And, um, and we would say, have at it. No limits. Do what you think the patient needs. Often we would ask for a review and we'd say, you know what? You're not giving enough care to this patient. This patient needs a care manager and we have one that we're gonna buddy up with you to see if you know, maybe they can get into a day treatment program. Maybe there was substance abuse and addiction issues that weren't being treated. So we worked really hard and we took sort of a completely out of the box approach that made sense to us in our profession, knowing what we know about care. So what did we see? Um, 20, almost 25% of all Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont members had a coexisting medical and mental health condition, very consistent with the national figures we saw. And it's a lot more expensive when you have asthma at $3,700 without a mental illness and put in a mental illness, you're up at $10,000. So uh, we had a lot of information out of the gate that we thought was persuasive. If we could bend that curve, we could save money and give better care. So one of the things that really matters to hospitals, also matters to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, is emergency room visits. It's expensive care. It's also often not optimal care for mental health. And so here you see uh, the orange line was Magellan. And this was the number of emergency room visits starting in the fourth quarter of 2010 going out to the first quarter of 2016. And uh, you can see a little ups and downs, but they were projected to keep going out like this. We took over with Vermont Collaborative Care in 2013, we immediately started driving down the emergency room visits related to mental health and substance abuse issues. That saves real money. That got a lot of attention. So uh, we now have three years of experience. Magellan was charging $1.35 PM PM. Our cost for Blue, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, uh, the retreat Vermont Collaborative Care is 92 cents PM PM. So just another way of looking at uh, the mental health and substance abuse ER visits. So um, the blue bars are mental health, the orange or gold bars are um, substance abuse, and they both came down, were managed, managed better, just to give you a little bit more granular information there. What happened with inpatient care? So inpatient care was slated to go up, and we've bent the curve very slightly. And we, I can show you a lot more granular information on that. Uh, but I don't think that's such a bad thing because we're coming at people weren't being adequately treated. So let's, rather than putting somebody in an inpatient bed and giving them two days and kicking them out before they're really ready, maybe they need four days. And if we invested those other two days, maybe we'd prevent the next emergency department visit and contain costs. So, we have some, some further data that I'd be happy to share that kind of bears that out. But we were able to bend the curve a little bit on inpatient costs. This is the, the HUB program, the Suboxone program for opioid addiction. Um, so uh, this is, um, for example, before the hubs were available, um, 
the number of ER visits and during the hubs. So uh, we steering patients towards the, the hub. So this is inpatient admissions before and after. Um, just to give you a sense of, uh, of how we've done with substance abuse as well. Uh, and then here's something, it's not, it's a little something. I won't say I'm not bragging and thumping my chest on this one, but our readmission rate, because that's another big driver. So if you look, our readmission rate uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, 30 days, is uh, 5.27 in 2014, almost 6% 2016. Um, and it's not great, it's not, uh, we've got more work to do there, uh, but the national commercial insurance readmission rate in 2014 was almost 9% and the same in 2015. So we're still about 3% better than the national average in terms of readmission rate, so, but more work to be done. Again, we've only been doing this for three years, which to me is unbelievable. So um, very proud of that. So, I'm just in conclusion, I'm happy to take your comments and have some discussion. Just back to that overall picture. Here we've got um, health uh, 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 length of uh, life, basically, in all of these countries. And if you look, uh, it's, uh, the yellow bar is, is overall, and then we've got male, green, and female, red. Japan, live longest, Australia, Canada, United States, way down here, is people with serious mental illness, right between Sudan, which is a really high-functioning failed state, and South Africa, which has also had its struggles recently, uh, coming out of, well, I won't get into politics. Anyway, <laughs> so it's time to make a difference, if for no other reasons, that this should be a national embarrassment and a real public health crisis, that people with mental illness really have the life expectancy of living in the Sudan as opposed to the United States. So I think, with all of that said, was that my last slide? Yes. Um, let's take some questions. I certainly covered a lot of ground. I understand that. Uh, but so if there's something I could help clarify or let me know. Or if you think I'm really off base, let me know too. I'm always, I'm a lifelong learner and I want to make sure what I'm thinking and doing makes sense. So. Peter. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Lewis, it's nice to have you back up in the Northeast. I'm Good glad whoever here. did it talked you into coming back. <laughs> um, couple questions. One of them is, uh, based on your research around the country, is there anyone who's got this right? Any, in a particular, in a small state environment? Um, secondly, um, from a theoretical point of view, if you, we have a situation that's the highest cost, the biggest impact, it's also the greatest opportunity. And in, in a capitated model or a, uh, the, the ACL model, in theory, people should be clamoring to get this done. Right. Why isn't that happening? Boy, well, um, first question first, there's, I don't think there's any place that's you know, a rock star in integrating behavioral health and bending this curve, turning things around. If you go to the SAMHSA or those websites, you'll see some really promising projects, but I can't say there's a statewide initiative. One of the things I will say that drew me back to this area in a really small state like Vermont, we've got half the population maybe of New Hampshire, is we should, if we don't, know every person with a serious mental illness and their co-occurring medical condition and be able to figure out what we need to meet their needs. So I think in smaller states, um, it is possible to get our arms around this. And uh, so I'm excited by that possibility. In Los Angeles, it's a tsunami of people and um, it really challenging. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to come together. The last question, I'd, I'd turn that back to you. I don't know how to, I feel like, um, again, I get that sort of intellectual light bulb. People say, oh yeah, okay, I see what you're talking about. But nobody sort of stepped up and said, let's do this. And um, at least me, I'm just one person, so it may be happening elsewhere. Uh, and I don't know why that is, I, except that we're in this massive change process and everyone's overwhelmed, in fairness. Um, it may have to do with allocation of benefit. Okay. Because you have an insurer, you've got a behavioral health provider, 
you've got a hospital, and you've got a consumer, and there's significant benefit, but who's getting access to that benefit and who isn't? Like when the ER visits go, they plummet. Right. Um, is there anything that makes up that difference to enable a hospital to say this is the best thing that we could do to, you know, preserve our assets to reinvest in something else? So that might be part of it. Right. Um, absolutely. Liz? So. illness spectrum, and I'm wondering if you could talk to uh, help for children that are, uh, have uh, um, some concerns in their early years and what's being done that might help with this curve later on in life. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, I've spent a lot of my career with children and families, so it's a, it's a part of the population that's very dear to me. Um, and we, we don't do prevention very well uh, in this country on a lot of, just on healthcare with kids and families, let alone, though we've done better, certainly with immunizations and CHIP plans and all of that stuff, so I won't say that, but on mental health, uh, abuse and neglect, those things we're still not doing well, and I, I will say that the opioid epidemic has really negatively impacted families. So we're seeing, you know, much more, many more traumatized children and families um, where the caregiving has kind of fallen apart because the parents are, are addicted with, to substances. So that's been a huge challenge. Um, you know, for me, it goes back to um, some of the social determinants as well. What can we wrap around families to support them economically, housing, uh, good preschools, good daycares, all of that's where it starts. So next week, or early November, the retreat is hosting a uh, early child care symposium for the state of Vermont. And we're basically inviting people in and saying, you know, we do our own child care at the retreat for our staff and also for some community members, saying, you know, come on, you gotta, you gotta step up your game. Because if you get a kid in, even as an infant, you're also seeing the parent and what's going on. If there's problems, you can identify them and refer them for services. So it's, it's not like a mental health program as much as an early childhood wellness program, I would say. Yeah. Uh, my name's Tammy Baxter. Oh, hi. I'm, um, I'm the director of the ACO over at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And I do have to say that all the way up from our CEO to our board, we just had our annual board meeting, behavioral health is on the top of the list. Yes. It is on the top three tiers for our fiscal year that we're in. It's, I think, part of the reason is what you're looking for. Part of it's access. Part of it is yep. the number of clinicians. There is a, it's a, there's not a lot of them around. Yep. So it's to be able to put the clinicians into the family practice to try and create that whole medical home model that we've all been looking towards and building towards is starting. We're definitely looking at telehealth. If we have more clinicians in the north, how can we support our practices in the south so that we're taking care of their entire population? So I, I, I do think it's a shift. There is, it's not so much a payment issue. Mm -hmm. I know in our ACO contracts, behavioral health is in there. We sit at the table with the payers and talk about behavioral health. and. Um, and part of what we're seeing is that there just isn't enough. And some contracts have, they want you to use certain telehealth or certain behavioral health mm -hmm. outside of the states, which you know may not be the best if you can't integrate that into the community care. So I think part of it is that, and I think part of it is using the community resources that we have. Everybody needs to know what's out there and where to get the patient to at the right time, at the right place, like you said. Yep. So, but I do think it, it, there is a growing statewide initiative to improve that and make it better so we can make a difference. Yes, I'm glad you said that. Dartmouth is, you know, as we know, we talked about the Dartmouth Atlas and, and ACOs. Dartmouth has been in the lead in many of these areas in Vermont and New Hampshire, so uh, kudos to, to Dartmouth Hitchcock. And uh, um, so, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm, as I said, I was trying to be provocative a little bit because I feel like I want to prod all of us to start thinking a little bit more about what we can do. But there are, certainly you're right, um, they've stepped up in a big way, which is great. Yeah. So I'm Alexa Charlie Hansen. I'm in the occupational therapy department. And the other thing that I teach other than leadership is our mental health evaluation and intervention course. And occupational therapy, the profession was actually born in the mental health practice. And we, as a profession, drifted away from that. In the last 10 years, our national organization has really been pushing for our education programs to train more clinicians, occupational therapy clinicians, to work within these integrated systems because it's not just 
psychiatry. They do need psychiatry, but they also need social work and a more holistic view in lots of different ways. And only recently has there been more opportunity for occupational therapy practitioners who are interested to even find a place where who would hire them. So I think that when we ask why this isn't happening, it's because there are a lot of things that go into that system. It's clinicians who are willing to sub, who, and trained to step up and take these positions. It's payment and reimbursement for those mm-hmm. systems. And then it's also that lack of any type of continuum of care. So we've had occupational therapists in inpatient who want to work in the community, but there hasn't been a position for them or it's a grant funded position and then it disappears. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm really, really optimistic like you that if we from a academic perspective can push and train and work with our community partners during this change to make sure that our clinicians have the skills and that the positions are available on the other side, then we can start addressing this. And then I would say the other reason that the demand isn't there is that our country has a real issue with stigma. And we do not want to recognize the fact that a number of our community members are suffering from pretty significant mental illnesses, and we don't want to talk about it. It's the elephant in the room. I would agree. I was talking to somebody about uh, one of our units is primarily, uh, well, it's co-occurring detox uh, uh, issues, and I was talking to a a visitor, uh, touring them around the unit a couple weeks ago, and they sort of took me aside and they said, Dr. Josephson, these people with opioid addiction, they don't get better, do they? They they never get better, right? Like, why why are we wasting our money on them with these programs? Um, and I think that's more of a stigma issue, maybe ignorance as well. Um, so I was glad they asked the question, made the statement, and I was able to say, mm, not so true. <laughs> um, and you know, I wish, in terms of our evidence base and our practice, I wish we had the slam dunk opioid addiction treatment that would, you know, one shot clear people and they're back to work and home and family. Uh, we know it's a bumpy road, but we have seen many people recover and uh, get their lives back. And so we've got to. Op- offer them those opportunities, so. Yeah. Regarding your hub and spoke model in Suboxone, we have in many of our communities a shortfall of primary care providers that are comfortable, right. trained, or in a position to prescribe Suboxone. How did you get around that, or how did you encourage more primary care providers, either A, to prescribe, or yep. remotely, who was doing the prescribing of the Suboxone? Right, great question. So, uh, and I'm, this is my newness in Vermont, so if somebody knows this better than I, tell me <laughs> the details. But there is a, a program that was funded in Vermont called the Blueprint for Health, and part of that was uh, providing support to prim- in primary care for Suboxone uh, prescription writing. We've also been really working to expand the number of patients that a physician can carry uh, with Suboxone treatment. Um, so the blueprint for health has really been sort of in our local community, the way we've been able to push out Suboxone treatment beyond our, our hub program uh, through the spokes into the community. And there's been funding for that and training and our psychiatrists provide backup. Um, so that's been a, a really a successful thing in Vermont. I don't know if that's replicated in New Hampshire and other, other states. Cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.